couple of minutes past and we have a lot to get through tonight, so we may get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this educational webinar, um, summarising new developments in the treatments for chronic kidney disease. Um, if I could just reflect on how far we've come. It wasn't that long ago that we had very little to treat people with chronic kidney disease and slow the progression. Um, we've had the excitement generated from the cardiovascular outcome trials, which hinted at uh, promise for people with kidney disease. We then had the, um, the anticipation generated by the credence results, a, a study designed to test benefits for people with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And that's culminated most recently in the DAPA CKD trial, which has included people with and without diabetes. We're really fortunate today to have representatives of those trials. Um, people who've worked on the meta-analyses, um, Professor Vlado Perkovic, who chaired the Credence uh, Steering Committee, and then most recently, Professor Hido Landis hispink who chaired the DAPA CKD trial that was just presented um, a, sh a few short weeks ago. Um, so we'll kick off uh, with an introduction, if I could have the next slide. And as we get underway, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet today. I pay my respect to the elders past, present and future and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. So we're going to start with an introduction. Uh, Dr. Brendan Nguyen, who's written one of the um, impact for meta-analyses, will lead us with an introduction on the summary of evidence of people uh, with kidney disease and diabetes. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Jardine. And um, this, and today, uh, um, hello everyone in the audience. Today I'm going to talk briefly and summarize the evidence for SGLT2 inhibitors and their effect on major kidney outcomes, focusing on some of the major trials in people with type two diabetes in recent years that Dr. Jardine has alluded to. Next slide, please. So these are my disclosures. Next slide. So um, back uh, about, a year, uh, about a year ago, this was the state of the evidence in terms of randomized trials in people with uh, type two diabetes. And you can see uh, there were four main trials, Credence being the most recent one. And the three, and I'll point out some of the differences, important differences between these trials. You can see that Empiric, uh, Canvas and the DECLARE trials were predominantly low kidney risk populations and were to test and tested the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors on cardiovascular outcomes. And because these, uh, patient, because these trials recruited people with low kidney risk, they had higher mean EGFR, 10, which tended to be in the 70s or 80s, and most patients had normal albuminuria uh, with very small proportions with macroalbuminuria. In contrast, the Credence trial on the far right-hand corner recruited about 4,500 people with albuminuric kidney disease, 60% of whom had a GFR less than 60, and almost, almost all of whom had macroalbuminuria at baseline. Other important points that you can see um, here is that most patients across these trials were on uh, on renin-angiotensin system blockade, and this was mandated for entry uh, into the Credence trial. So almost all patients on a RAS blockade in the Credence trial. Since these trials have been completed and reported, there have also been trial, there has been a trial of uh, urticoflozin, a cardiovascular outcome trial called Virtus CV, which was recently reported this year, as well as several trials in non-diabetic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which have demonstrated significant clear separate benefits on heart failure outcomes in people with and without diabetes. So on to the next slide, please. So in terms of evidence for kidney protection, um, we can see here that across the class, SGLT2 inhibition reduces the risk of dialysis transplant or death due to kidney disease, perhaps the most important patient-centered outcome. Across these trials, you can see most of the power is derived from the Credence trial, which had the largest number of events with smaller number of events in the cardiovascular outcome trials. And moving on to the next slide, you can see there's also a clear and separate effect on end-stage kidney disease alone, which is again predominantly powered by the Credence trial. On to the next slide. In terms of the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors on composite kidney 
based outcomes. Um, you can see these effects are clearly demonstrated here and there's at least a 30 to 40% risk reduction in substantial loss of kidney function defined as doubling of serum creatinine or 40% decline in EGFR, end stage kidney disease or kidney death. And importantly, this effect appears consistent across all of the agents studied to date. And then onto the next slide, when we include cardiovascular death in, these, in this kidney outcome, so a composite cardiorenal outcome, again, you can see mostly consistent effects across the class with an overall risk reduction in the order of 30%. Um, there have been quest one of the important uh, features of SGLT2 inhibitors is that the, the, their glucose lowering effect is dependent on GFR, such that their glucose lowering effect diminishes substantially as kidney function declines. But as you can see here, this is the effect of SGLT2 inhibition on substantial loss of kidney function, end stage kidney disease, or death due to kidney disease. And you can see there are clear and separate benefits across all subgroups, including those patients with a starting EGFR of less than 45, in whom the glucose lowering effect is essentially negligible. And this strongly suggested at the time that these drugs have kidney protective benefits that are independent of their glucose lowering effect. And Professor Heerspink will talk more to this in the coming uh, slides. When we look at the effect across different levels of albuminuria, in contrast to renin-angiotensin system blockade, where the benefits are largely in people with elevated levels of proteinuria, you can see here that the benefits of SGLT2 inhibition on kidney outcomes are similar regardless of the level of albuminuria baseline, with even substantial kidney protection noted in people with normal albuminuria. Of course, with similar benefits in people with macroalbuminuria, the, the absolute benefits of treatment are larger in this, popu in this population. Importantly, um, the available data uh, that has uh, been reported so far suggests that kidney protection is also consistent regardless of the use of renin-angiotensin system blockade, although with fewer events no, uh, in people not on renin-angiotensin system blockade at baseline. And um, initially there were concerns about the effect of these drugs on risk of acute kidney injury due to the uh, diuretic effect or mechanism of action of these agents. However, this has not been borne out in the randomized trials to date. And in fact, the available collective data suggests that these agents reduce the risk of acute kidney injury about by about 25%. The reason for this is not entirely clear. However, these drugs reduce energy expenditure in the proximal tubule, which may reduce the susceptibility of these cells to ischemic or volume-related insults, although there are a number of other hypotheses that have been raised as to how these agents protect against acute kidney injury, and further work is needed to understand this effect. So in summary, we've got very clear evidence from almost 40,000 participants with type 2 diabetes that these drugs have powerful and separate effects on a range of major kidney outcomes, including the most important outcomes to patients, that is the, uh, the effect on dialysis, transplant or death due to kidney disease, with also substantial reductions across a range of other kidney outcomes, uh, all I'd like to say at this point. Thank you, Brendan. That was a terrific summary of where we are, where are we up to. Um, I'd now like to introduce Claire Arnett, who's a cardiologist and a postdoc at the George Institute, who has been looking at the summary of the data for people who are cut with cardiovascular outcomes and the safety issues. Claire. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jardine. So yes, I've been tasked with discussing SGLT2 inhibition and cardiovascular disease in 10 minutes. Um, not a small task, but I'll do my best. Um, next slide, please. So a lot of the analysis that I'll be presenting this evening is based on some work that we've done at the George Institute. And really the main motivation for doing these analysis was some specific questions around not just what are the cardiovascular benefits, but who benefits from SGLT2 inhibition? Specifically, is it just those with type 2 diabetes or do other populations, such as those with chronic kidney disease or heart failure, benefit? And then when we're discussing those with type 2 diabetes, is it just those with established cardiovascular disease or just those with a history of heart failure? 
And also the question about does renal function matter in the cardiovascular benefit you may or may not derive from SGLT2 inhibition. And there's also the important outcome of stroke and is there any benefit um, for stroke with this drug class? Next slide. So I'll be discussing some of the key event-driven placebo-controlled SGLT2 inhibitor studies. Four of the trials that I'll be talking about, so the Empereg Outcome Trial, the Canvas Program, Declare Timmy and Credence, are, as we said, in type 2 diabetic populations. I'll also be discussing DAPA-HF, which is a study in those with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There's also the uh, EMPA reduced study, which was released last month that I won't be discussing tonight. And then a quick slide on Virtus, which was recently presented at ADA. Next slide, please. So firstly, I'll discuss the type two diabetes trials. As Brendan alluded to, there are three cardiovascular outcome trials, all with a primary outcome of MACE. So the Empereg outcome, which was an empagliflozin in type 2 diabetics with established cardiovascular disease. The CANVAS program, which was a study of canagliflozin in those with type 2 diabetes. And then a mixture of those with established cardiovascular disease and those at high risk of cardiovascular disease. We then had the declare timi trial, which is a study of dapagliflozin, again in type 2 diabetics but again, in those with and without established cardiovascular disease. And finally, the Credence study, which was a renal outcome study of those with both type two diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And this again was of the study drug canagliflozin. Next, please. Um, Brendan highlighted some of the renal differences between the trials as a true nephrologist. As a cardiologist, I'd like to focus on, as I said, some of the cardiovascular differences. And really the baseline characteristics of the studies just reflect the inclusion criteria. So between 10 and 14%, so only a small fraction, had a history of heart failure um, at study inclusion. As I said, the cardiovascular disease history ranged from 100% in EMPA um, to between 40 and 60% in the other trials. And as you can see, the mean EGFR at baseline was normal, uh, in the three cardiovascular outcome trials, um, as distinct from in the um, Credence trial, where you had a population with chronic kidney disease and albuminuria. Next slide, please. So firstly, I'd like to discuss the overall cardiovascular benefits of this drug class. As Brendan said, we had quite an impressive power with 38,723 participants. What you can see is that this drug class reduces the risk of MACE, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, hospitalization for heart failure, and all-cause mortality. I'll make a specific note of the fact that there was an over 30% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. Another point I would like to make is that there was no overall benefit for stroke if you look at the subgroups defined by a baseline of cardiovascular disease, we were not able to demonstrate a separately significant benefit in those without established cardiovascular disease. However, if you look at the P for heterogeneity, which I apologize is quite small under the hazard ratios, you can see that there is no evidence of heterogeneity between these groups. That is, there is no evidence that the benefit of SGLT2 inhibition differs based on history of, car of cardiovascular disease. Next, please. So that's my highlighting of the very impressive heart failure outcome. So the next question we had is, well, what about renal function? And I should make the important point that all the data that I'm presenting today is relative rather than absolute benefits. So again, you can see that there is a consistent benefit for MACE, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, hospitalization for heart failure, and all-cause mortality, regardless of baseline EGFR. And the subgroups that we used for these analysis were an EGFR less than or greater than 60 mils per minute per meter squared. Next. Stroke is very interesting. As I've said, there was no overall benefit in the population for stroke. 
However, if you focus on an EGFR of less than 60, you'll see that there was a 25% reduction in stroke outcome, with a P for heterogeneity of 0.02, indica indicating a significant difference between these subgroups. Next slide, please. This slide demonstrates Again, the clear and consistent benefit for cardiovascularity, cardiovascularity, cardiovascular and mortality um, outcomes in these patients, regardless of the history of heart failure at baseline. Next. Now, I have not included a slide on adverse events, but Meg, Meg since you mentioned it, I will make the comment that in these meta-analysis, there was an overall reduction in serious adverse events in those on active treatment. I now wanted to spend a moment on DAPA-HF, which was the first trial to publish on the patient subgroup with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Next. As you can see, this trial was a cardiovascular trial. It was a cardiovascular population and only 40% had diabetes at baseline and around 38% had a history of atrial fibrillation. Next slide. The primary outcome for DAPA-HF was a composite outcome of hospitalisation for heart failure or urgent heart failure visit, as well as cardiovascular death. And you can see that treatment with dapagliflozin reduced the primary outcome by 26%. Oh, back. You can also see that there were some important endpoint secondary outcomes, such as a reduction in all-cause mortality. And these effects were consistent across subgroups defined by the presence or absence of diabetes um, for the primary outcome. When we looked at the, the, the population of patients from DAPA-HF who did have type 2 diabetes, which was around 2,000 participants, we actually meta-analyzed these in addition to the four type 2 diabetes studies. And for the primary out, for the outcome of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, there was a consistent 25% reduction in that outcome with active treatment. Next. Now I'll quickly give the one slide on Avertis, which was recently presented at ADA. It again was a type 2 diabetes study in those with established cardiovascular disease. It was a study of ertugliflozin. The primary outcome for these analysis was also MACE. Now they demonstrated a non-inferiority but no benefit for ertugliflozin as compared to placebo for the MACE outcome with no difference in cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction or stroke. Active treatment was associated with a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. Next. So in conclusion, SGLT2 inhibition reduces hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, MACE, and all cause mortality in those with type 2 diabetes. And these benefits are consistent across subgroups defined by cardiovascular disease history, hospitalization for heart failure history, and renal function. And again, I'll reiterate the fact that these are relative benefits. SGLT2 inhibition also, oh, back please, <laughs> also reduces um, the risk of, oh, back please reduces the risk of hospitalization for heart failure or cardiovascular death in those with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, regardless of type two diabetes status. And an important finding that is quite hypothesis generating is the fact that whilst there was no overall benefit for stroke, there was a possible benefit in those with impaired renal function. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. That was a great summary. Um, and now we're going to hear from the chair of the dapa CKD steering committee, um, Hido lambers Hearspink. Um, and I'll point out that we've got given Hido more time here than he had at the ESC where these results were, uh, were initially presented. So I think we're all really keen to hear what you've got to tell us, Hido. Thank you very much, Meg. And thanks again, everyone, for the opportunity to present the um, dapa CKD results in more than 10 minutes. This is, uh, this is great. Um, I, will, um, I will spend some time on the background of the trial, why we, why, why we conducted the trial, and um, we'll focus, of course, on the results and, and give you some more insight. Um, I hope you can see my screen. 
and the slides. Yes, that looks that looks terrific. It's on. It's yes. Now it's on slide view. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 So we all know that the prevalence of chronic kidney disease increases. In the year 90s, chronic, the, the, the chronic kidney disease was ranked number 27 as the most common cause of global mortality. And that has increased over the last decades, now being in the top 20. It's also well known that the prevalence of chronic kidney disease is approximately 10% globally. And many patients with chronic kidney disease are actually undiagnosed, in particular in the early stage of disease, which means that we have to better screen and detect um, early chronic kidney disease in order to delay the progression of disease to end stage kidney failure. It's also finally well known that chronic kidney disease is often present in patients with diabetes and hypertension, which are the main causes of chronic kidney disease. And about two thirds of all patients have either diabetes or hypertension. Now to illustrate a point that, that screening for, for early stage chronic kidney disease is important, I'm showing you this slide. These are data from the United States presented last year at, the, at an international conference. And what you see here is the percentage of undiagnosed patients with type 2 diabetes with chronic kidney disease. So in, in the 2011, about two thirds of all patients with CKD stage, stage uh, 3A, a GFR between 45 and 60, they were undiagnosed in the United States. Well, these numbers have improved because the number of uh, diagnosed cases improved. As you can see, the number of undiagnosed cases has declined. There's still more than 50, there's still 50% of patients with undiagnosed type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease in stage 3A. That number is around 20 to 30% in stage 3B. And even in stage 4, where you think that all patients are being detected and diagnosed, there's still around 10% of patients in the United States who are undiagnosed. In the UK, another example, only 39.5% of patients with microalbuminuria actually had a code for microalbuminuria on their record. Just to illustrate that we need to better screen for albuminuria and GFR to identify patients at risk of chronic kidney disease, particularly in this era where we have appropriate treatments to slow progression of kidney disease, as you've just heard, also in the early stages of disease. Now, not only is chronic kidney disease associated with a high risk of kidney failure, it is also associated with heart failure. These are data published a few years ago demonstrating that the incidence of heart failure, either with preserved or reduced ejection fraction, is actually much higher, the blue lines, among patients with chronic kidney disease compared to patients without chronic kidney disease. If we stratify the same population by the levels of albuminuria, you see a similar picture with more heart failure being present among people with microalbuminuria compared to people without microalbuminuria. But heart failure also accelerates renal function decline. Another study also published a couple of years ago, demonstrated that among people with heart failure, the proportion of patients with a rapid EGFR decline, defined as more than five mils per minute per year, was much higher, 22%, compared to patients with heart, without heart failure. And then if we look at the incidence of chronic kidney disease or the incidence of chronic kidney disease or mortality, again, chronic kidney disease incidence is much higher among people with heart failure compared to people without heart failure. So this illustrates that there is a vicious circle between chronic kidney disease, heart failure, exacerbating of heart failure, and then heart failure, again, exacerbating chronic kidney disease, so that the two are closely associated and we have to break that vicious circle in order to pro improve prognosis for these patients. And then finally, chronic kidney disease is associated with a reduced life expectancy. Data published in The Lancet a few years ago demonstrated that among people with, who are aged on average 55 years, the life expectancy with normal kidney function is 20 years, but significantly decreases if chronic kidney disease is present. And life expectancy is only about 5.5 years among patients with CKD stage 5.
or those who require renal replacement therapies. And similar data is shown for albuminuria, a life expectancy of 21 years among people with normal albuminuria and only nine years if you have macroalbuminuria. So we need better treatments for patients with chronic kidney disease. And in for, unfortunately, much of the clinical trials that have been conducted over the last 20 years focused on patients with type 2 diabetes, and all of them were unable to deliver a new agent for the treatment of chronic kidney disease, except the Credence trial, which was published last year with the SGLD2 inhibitor, canacliflozin. What you also can appreciate from this slide is that the number of clinical trials that are conducted in patients without diabetes is actually much less compared to patients with diabetes. There are only four big clinical trials, one of them enrolling a mixed population of patients with diabetes and without diabetes. And moreover, the size of these trials to generate important evidence is much smaller. All these trials, except this one, were less included less than 500 patients, whereas in the type 2 diabetes trials, they were much larger to detect small but meaningful clinical benefits. And then there's only one clinical trial conducted in the early 90s with captopril in patients with type 1 diabetes. Now, what did we learn from these trials? Well, in the early, in, at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, there were a lot of clinical trials conducted with ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and then in this era, we have the DAPA CKD, Credence, SONA, and Fidelio trial. But if you look at the success of these trials, actually only very few led to a license for these drugs. A, a, re, a label with kidney protection is only available for Captopril, Lisinopril, Ramipril, and Losartan and Urbosartan in patients with diabetic kidney disease. But then if you look in patients without diabetic kidney disease, only the RAIN trial has a label for Ramipril in Europe for kidney protection. And that label specifically states that only people with a proteinuria level more than three grams per day can receive Ramipril. It, for, the non for the broader, wider non-diabetic kidney disease population, we don't have any other drug. And of course, nowadays, we have for patients with type 2 diabetes and kidney disease, the credence results and the label for kidney protection with canacliflozin. So we need new drugs in particular among for patients with non-diabetic kidney disease. Could SGLV2 inhibitors be efficacious in people with non-diabetic kidney disease? Well, of course, we know that the SGLD2 uh, transporter is located in the proximal tubule and reabsorbs glucose and sodium. And if we block the transporter, that leads to increased glycosuria and atherosis. And 60 gram per day glucose loss, which is equivalent to about 240 kilocalorie per day. So no surprise, these patients lose body weight and about 25 millimoles of sodium excretion initially during the first days of treatment. That leads, for example, in a DECLARE trial, and you've already heard about the DECLARE trial, to a 17% relative risk reduction in the composite endpoint of hospitalization for heart failure cardiovascular death, although there was no significant risk reduction in the DECLARE trial for the MACE endpoint, a 7% reduction, which did not read statistically significant. However, there was a significant reduction in the co-primary endpoint of heart failure CV death. But I think more importantly, in that trial, there was a 24% risk reduction for a renal composite endpoint, including cardiovascular death, and a profound reduction for um, the renal-specific endpoint that excluded cardiovascular death, a 46% relative risk reduction. However, the as you've heard already, declare enrolled patients at early stage of chronic kidney disease, and we don't know whether these results are directly translatable to patients with diabetic kidney disease, let alone non-diabetic kidney disease. In the DECLARE trial, there were also significant reductions in, in albuminuria and significant reductions in the risk of transitioning of albuminuria class from normal to micro or no, normal to micro and then to macroalbuminuria. 
What about the effects of dapagliflozin in patients with diabetic kidney disease? This is a study, a relatively short-term study of 24 weeks in duration that looked at the effect of dapagliflozin or the combination dapagliflozin plus sexagliptin versus placebo in patients with diabetic kidney disease who had elevated albuminuria and a GFR between 30 and 60 mils per minute. And that study showed that indeed there is a significant reduction in albuminuria with dapagliflozin. And if you combine dapagliflozin with sexagliptin, you get a further reduction in albuminuria. What you also see in the trial is this acute dip in EGFR, which is then EGFR level sustained over time. And you'll see that at the end of the trial during the washout period, there is a reversal in EGFR. EGFR go back to baseline and in the indicating that this initial dip in GFR is not a structural worsening of kidney function, but it's most likely a hemodynamic effect and reflects the mechanism of action of all SGL2 inhibitors, including dapagliflozin. Could SGL2 inhibitors then also be beneficial in patients without di diabetes and chronic kidney disease? This study published a few months ago try to answer that question. This was a crossover trial where patients with chronic kidney disease were receiving dapagliflozin for six weeks, were then continued in a washout period of six weeks and then received placebo treatment for six weeks. GFR in this study was measured with gold standard techniques using iohexyl clearance. And what you appreciate from the slide is that indeed dapagliflozin caused an acute reduction in GFR of about 6.6 .6 mils per minute compared to placebo. This reduction in GFR was completely reversible after treatment discontinuation, again indicating that just like the type 2 diabetes population, this is a hemodynamic effect and reflects the mechanism of action, namely reduction in intraglomerular pressure and reduced single nephron hyperfiltration. The primary endpoint of the trial was proteinuria and there was no change in proteinuria, although there was a 17% difference in proteinuria between the dapagliflozin, uh, albumin-creatinine ratio between dapagliflozin and the placebo arm, which however did not reach statistical significance, but it suggests that indeed there may be pharmacodynamic effects of SGLD2 inhibitors in patients with chronic kidney disease without diabetes. We have more evidence about the effects of dapagliflozin in patients with, with and without diabetes on kidney function because the DAPA-HF trial, which was a hard clinical outcome trial that evaluated the effects of dapagliflozin in patients with heart failure, also measured EGFR over time. And that trial showed that in patients with diabetes, there is again an acute reduction in EGFR followed by preservation of kidney function over time. But if we look in patients without diabetes, which were also enrolled in the DAPA-HF trial, there is an acute reduction in GFR followed by a similar um, preservation of kidney function over time. Which it's, the trial only had a follow-up duration of 18 months. And therefore, it's difficult to really dis distinguish the benefits on, on kidney function because at the end of the trial, the EGFR levels are similar. But maybe if we follow these patients longer, if we include patients with more, um, uh, uh, with a lower GFR, um, it may be possible that dapagliflozin is also efficacious in patients without diabetes. So that formed the background and the rationale for the DAPA-CKD trial. So to summarize, chronic kidney disease is an important contributor to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And I've shown you that until recently, and you know that as well, the only classes of medication proven to slow progression of CKD are interventions in the renin and angiotensin system. SGLD2 inhibitors, including dapagliflozin, have shown favorable effects on cardiovascular and kidney outcomes. And the DAPA-HF trial showed that dapagliflozin reduced the risk of worsening of heart failure or death from cardiovascular causes. And this effect was independent of the presence of diabetes. So we hypothesized that dapagliflozin could also preserve kidney function and improve outcome in people with chronic kidney disease, independently of the presence of diabetes.
So we therefore designed the DAPA CKD trial to assess whether treatment with DAPA cliflozin compared to placebo reduced the risk of kidney failure and cardiovascular events in people with chronic kidney disease who either could have type 2 diabetes or did not have type 2 diabetes, but all patients were receiving standard of care, including an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. The primary outcome of the trial was a 50% EGFR decline in stage kidney disease or renal or cardiovascular deaths, and there were three secondary outcomes. A kidney-specific endpoint, 50% EGFR decline and stage kidney disease or renal deaths. A second secondary outcome, cardiovascular deaths or heart failure hospitalization, and then finally, all-cause mortality. We enrolled adult patients with EGFR between 25 and 75 and a urinary albumin to creatinine ratio between 200 and 5,000 milligram per gram. The key inclusion exclusion criteria are shown on, top of, on the top of the slide. These individuals were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to dapagliflozin 10 milligram or placebo and were then followed for these clinical outcomes. Inpatient clinical visits occurred approximately every month during the trial. The trial was originally designed to capture 681 events, which provided 90% power to detect a 22% relative risk reduction for the primary composite outcome. The trial was indeed an international clinical trial conducted at 21, in 21 countries at 386 sites, and we enrolled 4,304 participants. The countries listed in blue participated in the trial. The first participant was enrolled on the 2nd of February in 2017. And then earlier this year, at the end of March, after a regular review meeting, the Data Monitoring Committee recommended that the trial be stopped due to overwhelming efficacy. The trial closeout procedure started in April and the last patient last visit occurred on the 12th of June, at which time the median follow-up was 2.4 years. I already mentioned that 4,304 participants were randomized to treatment with dapagliflozin 10 milligram or placebo. In the dapagliflozin group, 10 patients discontinued the study. Eight withdrew their consent and two were lost to follow up. In the placebo group, five participants discontinued the study, three withdrew their consent, and also two were lost to follow up. So overall, 99.7% of the population completed the study, and at the end of the trial, final status was known in all but five participants, which was 99.9%. The baseline characteristics of the population are shown here. The average participant was 62 years and one third was female. Half of our population was white and one third was Asian. Two thirds of the population had a diagnosis of type two diabetes and the mean GFR was 43 mils per minute, median USCR close to 1000 and ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers were used by 97% of the cohort. In 3%, there was a documented intolerance to these drugs, and these patients could also participate in the trial. And the primary outcome of the trial is shown in this slide. In the placebo group, 312 patients experienced the primary endpoint. In the dapagliflozin group, this endpoint was, was reached by 197 participants, which led to a 39% relative risk reduction or a hazard ratio of 0.61 with a p-value that indicated a highly statistically significant treatment effect. The number needed to treat is only 19, which means that 19 patients, DAPA-CKD participants, have to be treated for the duration of the trial to prevent one of these clinically meaningful endpoints. The key secondary endpoint, the kidney-specific endpoint, uh, occurred in 243 participants in the placebo group, and this was decreased by 101 uh, events to 142 events in the dapagliflozin group, which led to a 44% relative risk reduction or a hazard ratio of 0.56, and again, with a p-value that indicated a highly statistically significant treatment effect. If we then further look in, in the kidney specific endpoint, and we focus on a clinically meaningful endpoint, chronic dialysis, kidney transplantation, or renal death. 
which was a pre-specified endpoint in our trial, dapagliflozin also significantly reduced this endpoint by 34% with a p-value of 0 0.0072. So to summarize these findings, I'm I'm presenting you this forest plot with the overall results showing in the top row and the individual components of the primary endpoints shown in the rows below. And what you appreciate is that for every individual component favors the dapagliflozin group. And in fact, every kidney specific component was statistically significant. The cardiovascular AD1 cardiovascular death, which did not reach statistical significance, but the point estimates favored epicliflozin as well. Now, an important question at the trial, of course, is whether these results are consistent in patients with or without type 2 diabetes. So therefore, I'm showing you this forest plot. Again, the overall results shown in the top row, and then the effects in patients with type 2 diabetes and without type 2 diabetes. Dapagliflozin reduced the primary endpoint in patients with type 2 diabetes by 36%, which was statistically significant, and in patients without type 2 diabetes, it reduced the endpoint by 50%. However, the p-value for interaction is 0.24, which indicates that there is no evidence to suggest that the overall results are different in patients with or without type 2 diabetes. So, in our interpretation, dapagliflozin reduced the primary endpoint both in patients with or without type 2 diabetes with consistent effects in these two populations. The effects were also consistent when we analyzed them by baseline albuminuria, more or less than 1000 milligram, or baseline EGFR, more or less than 45 milliliter per minute. And what you also see is that in each of these subgroups, the effect was statistically significant. Now, the DAPA-CKD trial pre-specified in total eight subgroups, and I'm presenting you the all results in every subgroup. It's not my intention to draw your attention to each subgroup individually, but overall, but look at the overall pattern. And that overall pattern indicates that the effects were very consistent in every subgroup and were statistically significant in each subgroup. The key, the second secondary outcome was cardiovascular death or heart failure for hospitalization. And this endpoint was also reduced by dapagliflozin by 29% or a hazard ratio of 0.71 with a p-value of 0 0.0089. It's interesting to note that the DAPA-HF trial demonstrated last year that dapagliflozin in patients with heart failure reduced the same endpoint, which was the primary endpoint in DAPA-HF, by 26%, a hazard ratio of 0.74. We now demonstrate a similar magnitude of effect, but now in patients with chronic kidney disease. And then finally, the third secondary endpoint was all-cause mortality. In the placebo group, 146 patients died during follow-up, and this number was reduced by dapagliflozin to 101 events, a hazard ratio of 0.69, and a p-value of 0.0035. What about the safety of dapagliflozin? Dapagliflozin was well tolerated in these patients with chronic kidney disease. The proportion of patients who discontinued the study, or who discontinued study drug, who discontinued the study drug due to an adverse event, or experienced a serious adverse event, were similar between the dapagliflozin and placebo group. The trial also pre-specified a number of adverse events of interest, including amputation, diabetic ketoacidosis, fractures, renal-related adverse events, major hypoglycemia, and volume depletion. And overall, the proportion of, these, of patients who experienced these events were generally similar between the dapagliflozin and placebo group. It's important to note that there were no diabetic ketoacidosis events in the dapagliflozin group, and major hypoglycemia did not occur among patients without type 2 diabetes. So that brings me to my conclusions. In patients with chronic kidney disease, both with and without type 2 diabetes, dapagliflozin compared to placebo reduced the risk of kidney failure. It reduced the risk of death from cardiovascular cause or heart failure hospitalization and a prolonged survival. In this population, dapagliflozin was well tolerated, which is in keeping with its established safety profile. 
I would like to thank all the patients and their families who participated in the trial. And of course, thanks all the in participating investigators. Also thanks to the adjudication committee who adjudicated all renal cardiovascular endpoints, the data monitoring committee and the DAPA CKD executive committee. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you very much. If we were face to face here, though, there'd be huge applause at this point, but uh, unfortunately we can't do that. Um, lots of fascinating results there and I'm sure people have a lot of questions. I'd encourage people to put their questions in the chat function so that we can, uh, can make sure we go through them all when we get to the Q&A at the end. But in the meantime, we'll hear first from uh, Professor Vlada Perkovic, um, the Dean of, of Medicine at UNSW um, and the Chair of the Steering Committee of the Credence Trial. I'm sure we're all looking forward to your insights, Vlado. Thanks very much, uh, Meg, and, and thanks to Hido and everyone else um, for the great presentations already and the opportunity to chat about this today. So what I thought I'd do today is try and look um, at the data in total. Uh, We've now got a large number of trials. We've heard about all of them at various points during this study. And the question is, what do they tell us? Do they tell us different things or are they sending us a consistent message and how should we interpret um, and then apply um, that data? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you just a series of updated meta-analyses that were kindly created by uh, Christos Agaropoulos um, at my request and he published them in that high impact medical journal called Twitter. Um, they are, I think, being prepared for publication elsewhere as we speak, um, but the, they're freely available on Twitter if people want to look them up and his, um, his handle is, is listed there. And what I've done here is had a look at the outcome of all the completed trials for a range of outcomes by drug. Um, and firstly, this is a composite kidney outcome, slightly different definitions in the various trials. Um, a number of different drugs um, have now looked at the effects on this outcome. And ultimately, you can see at the bottom there that the result um, updating the data that Brendan showed us earlier is a close to a 40% reduction in the risk of composite kidney outcomes. And really remarkable consistency across all of the trials with the possible exception of Virtus. And we'll come back to that perhaps a little bit later on. It could be that ertagliflozin is different it could also be that Virtus just got a little bit unlucky in terms of the um, conduct or the results of their study. And, and we can discuss that um, during the, the conversation piece, if you like. But really, for the three most commonly used drugs, CANA, DAPA, and empagliflozin, no clear differences. You'll see that the results of DAPA CKD here entirely consistent with all of the others. And depending on which um, endpoint we use, um, you get slightly different patterns, but the, but the, base, the underlying message is the same. We go to the next slide and look at the same um, sort of analysis for uh, major cardiovascular events. Um, and here um, we've, we've missed some slide, we've missed some um, data. So I might skip over this and just go to the next, the next one. Um, let's have a look at heart failure. And here you can see an even more compelling story. Now all four drugs, all of the trials um, that have, have reported of this outcome, you know, remarkably consistent findings. This one doesn't have DAPA CKD on it yet, but a very clear 30 odd percent reduction in the risk of heart failure. You know, no heterogeneity there if you look at the bottom of the study. Results that are, are remarkably clear um, and remarkably consistent. Look at the confidence intervals around the summary estimate. You know, uh, 26 to 36 percent reduction in risk. I don't think I've ever seen such a large reduction in risk with such tight confidence intervals before. If we go to the next slide, um, here, this is the data for cardiovascular death, which has been highly controversial, um, partly because Empareg found a very large benefit early on um, in the first study to be reported. And we've seen some variability in the results here. But once again, when we put it all together, we see quite a consistent 16% reduction um, across the various trials. You know, some Study, some trials showing a slightly bigger or slightly smaller effect um, or even no effect in um, DECLARE, but probably that's noise. If you look at the summary estimates for each of the individual drugs, again, we're getting pretty consistent findings. 
we go to the next slide and do the same thing now for all cause mortality, again, we see the same pattern in individual studies with some variability, even within the same drug. But um, overall, what we're seeing is a very consistent 15 to 20% reduction in the risk of all cause mortality. So if we go to the next slide, um, just to summarize it, I think what we've learnt and what DAPA CKD has strengthened and extended and reinforced in many ways is that this class of agents, SGLT2 inhibitors now clearly and consistently reduce the risk of kidney failure and loss of kidney function. And as Brendan showed us earlier, acute kidney injury too, across all levels of kidney function down to an EGFR of 25. It may um, also have benefits below that EGFR, but that's not being studied to date and remains I think, an open question. There's certainly very clear benefit, even down at the very lowest levels of EGFR that have been studied. Across all levels of albuminuria, um, for all the subgroups of micro, macro, and normal albuminuria, clearly benefit. In people with and without diabetes now, I think we can say, as a result of DAPA CKD, we know from other studies that it's true with or without heart failure, in people with or without heart failure, or cardiovascular disease. There are no meaningful differences in the renal protective effects across any of those patient subgroup populations. And the data now increasingly suggests that the results are consistent, at least across the three main agents that are commonly used, Canadapa and Empagliflozin, with some uncertainty persisting for Erdogliflozin, who have only one trial, which happen to have lesser um, benefits for reasons that are unclear. We also know that as well as the renal benefits, these agents reduce the risk of major cardiovascular events, they reduce the risk of heart failure, and they reduce the risk of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality, along with acute kidney injury. So we've got profound, um, uniquely broad benefits um, in people uh, with, with and without diabetes, in people with and without um, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And the big challenge for us all now is to get these agents to the people who are going to benefit from them and have improved health as a result. And I'll hand back there, Mick. Well, thank you. Thank you, Vlada. A very inspiring summary of where we're at. Um, I'll encourage people again to put their questions in the chat function. This is your chance to speak to the trialists, the people who designed these studies that have had such a monumental impact on our discipline. So please um, pick their brain. This is your chance to get a scoop. Um, I'm going to kick off though and ask um, particularly um, Vlado and Hido, um, as the, the people who have led the definitive trials in the area, it, are the answers all solved? Um, and particularly for people with non-diabetic non CKD, do we have a definitive answer or is there still some uncertainty in your minds? I think there's still some questions. Sorry, you don't go ahead. Yeah, you know, I'm happy to kick off, Lado. Um, I, I also think there's still some questions left. Um, the trials to date, credence and DAPA CKD involve people with high albuminuria levels know that there's um, more and more patients with low albuminuria levels and low kidney function, and we don't know the safety efficacy of that of SGLT2 inhibitors in that population. Um, there's perhaps even specific uh, populations that, that we don't know how SGLT2 inhibitors could work in, in those patients. Think about patients, kidney transplant patients. Could, could SGLT2 inhibitors um, reduce the risk of new onset diabetes in that population? Could, are SGLT2 inhibitors safe in that population? There are some initial studies that suggest that SGLT2 inhibition can be safely used. And can we also preserve kidney function in these patients and at the same time reduce new onset diabetes in those patients? And then finally, perhaps even dialysis patients. Um, it's important to realize that SGLT2 inhibitors were continued and dapacliflozin was continued. Um, and there was no reason to stop dapacliflozin or not by protocol in the DAPA CKD trial. We have an, um, and it seems that initial findings suggest that that confusion could be tolerated. We don't know the efficacy uh, on cardiovascular endpoints, mortality endpoints among patients uh, who are on dialysis and still have a little bit of residu residual kidney function and thus still are able to um, filter the drug so that the drug reaches the target. Um, that, that would also be a very interesting population to study and an important clinical question. So just to add, Meg, um, I think the um, 
I agree with, with what Vito says. It might be more interesting to ask, well, who doesn't benefit from these agents, you know, based on what we know at the moment? Um, and I think across people with type 2 diabetes, the only people unlikely to obtain or for whom there's uncertainty about whether they'll obtain benefit now is people with an EGFR below 25, where we just don't have the data. I think for you know, people with diabetes, I can't think of any other group who would be unlikely to get benefit. Now, the magnitude of the benefit and cost benefit analyses, et cetera, could be undertaken to identify um, those people who get the greatest benefit if resources are limited. But you know, in a country like Australia, where we've got pretty uh, good access to these agents, they're not terribly expensive compared to the US, um, you know, why I, I don't see a strong case really as to why anyone with diabetes who can tolerate them would not be taking one. I think beyond diabetes, or I think the points Hido's made about um, people with kidney transplants, they're a population in whom the risk balance ratio might be different and are important. And the dialysis question is intriguing, but we've got to see whether these drugs do anything in that population. So I think um, getting some data there would be valuable, but they are, of course, the population at the highest risk of any population for things like heart failure. Um, beyond that, in the non-diabetic population, I think it would be interesting once Hido's had a chance to have a look at some of the um, cause specific subgroups uh, in terms of causes of kidney disease, um, to look at whether there are differences in different types of kidney disease. We don't have data in non proteinuric, non diabetic kidney disease, but we're starting to really, you know, chop up the, the pie in very small pieces here. Um, and that will be important to generate um, at some point and valuable. Um, to fill out the evidence base, but I can think of no reason why they wouldn't work, given that they work at all albuminuria levels in diabetes and appear to work in albuminuric patients, similarly in people with and without diabetes. Other conditions like polycystic kidney disease, I, mean, I think you could ask some questions about conditions where the mechanism of progression are different, um, and no doubt we'll be talking about some of these things for many years, but, um, but there are still questions as we move forward the um, the number of questions that remain are, are narrowing quickly and Hido's just knocked out of the park a whole bunch of them. Right, so, um, so if I could press you both a little, do you think this, the, the results are stellar, but we have one trial in the non-diabetic population? Is, is the question answered for people with an EGFR over 25? Um, what does that say for the ongoing emphasis AD trial, the kidney trial? I think looking at the consistency of the results, um, at least in people with um, type 2 diabetes, um, but also when you compare in DAPA CKD, the consistency of the results on the primary endpoint in people with without diabetes, I think we have solid evidence that these drugs work and in people with a GFR down to 25. Um, Remember, 600 patients, 14% of the population in DAPA CKD had a GFR between 25 and 30, and the effects were consistent with the overall results in that CKD stage four space. Um, the EMPIREC trial will, will, will enroll patients with EGFR down to 20, but we know already from EMPIRE that that also included patients with heart failure and EGFR down to 20, that the drug was safe in, in that low re um, region. So I think that, that EMPIRE uh, kidney will show us that uh, EMPIRE is safe in people with a GFR down to 20. Um, but, they they will focus on patients with low albuminuria, as we just said, and, and low low kidney function because there we don't have the data generated yet. Um, but I I believe that when we look at the consistency of the results on kidney endpoints as, as shown by Flado, I think that it's a consistent class effect, and there's enough evidence now in people with higher albuminuria levels. Thank you. Um, we have had a, a question in, in the chat about uh, the CV mortality outcomes in EMPA. And I think the data that you showed us as well, Hido, with that perhaps confusing result with a non in DAPA CKD, a non significant result for CV mortality, but a very clear result for all cause mortality. Is this all just noise? That's a very good question and interesting uh, question that we're currently studying because the overall mortality. Mm -hmm 
is uh, shows a higher effect than the cardiovascular mortality. So it means that there's some cause of non um, non cardiovascular causes that have contributed to the uh, overall results. At first look, it seems that in particular infectious um, death, death due to infections is an important uh, endpoint and where the magnitude of effect was particularly high. Um, but it could also be that because although we adjudicated all the cardiovascular endpoints, um, it's still perhaps misclassification of cardiovascular death. Um, so that's why, that's the reason why we included all cause mortality as a third secondary endpoint because it's always difficult to precisely adjudicate the cause of death. Um, but we are currently analyzing the data in much more detail to better understand what is what happened in our trial. Claire, I don't know if you have any comments. Uh, you're a cardiologist and deal with this, this type of question all the time. Any thoughts from you? Yeah, thanks, Meg. Um, look, I think that the EMPA reg outcome cardiovascular mortality reduction was impressive. Um, and it's, it's not something we've seen in any of the other trials. And that includes, you know, EMPA reduced, that was EMPA reduced, which was the same drug. Um, it also wasn't seen, you know, the question that Sunil had was, is this just the secondary prevention cohort? And it's not been seen even when we look at the subgroup of participants in, in the other trials that had established cardiovascular disease. Um, so we actually spent a bit of time on this. We, we're about to publish um, a review looking at, um, I suppose, the heterogeneity in cardiovascular mortality across these trials. Um, and we spent quite a lot of time looking at trial participant characteristics, trial design, classification of death, SGLT2, um, selectivity of each of the drugs. Um, and, and the end kind of answer is there was no reason that we could identify for this heterogeneity. Um, and I do think it is certainly possible that that was a chance finding. All right. I'll, go further, Meg. I'll say it's chance. It's all okay. chance. There's no plausible <laughs> rationale. You know, we're seeing the same drug with um, results in different directions. Um, you know, it looks like noise. There's no um, consistency or pattern. Empereg got lucky first up and that sort of confused us all for a period of time. But, um, you know, you'd have to postulate that their drug works better in diabetes, but worse in non-diabetics. And it makes no sense. So I think it's, um, you know, I think it's impressive that these drugs reduce all-cause mortality. We've got few drugs that do that. There's still debate about statins and all-cause mortality. Here we've got a drug with a very clear and very important meaningful mortality we should that and move on rather than debating uh, triviality. Well, while I've got you thinking about play of chance, could I ask you about the Virtus results then? I, I was quite surprised personally by that, those, those results when they came out. So, so my views on that, Meg and others should comment too, is I think, um, you know, it's, it, we can't tell. There's only one study. So it could be that the drug is in some way less potent than the other drugs in the class or less effective, but all the intermediate outcome data don't really support that. They'd suggest it has similar effects as all the other drugs. Um, so we'd have to say that, it, you know, it has the same effect on glucose, et cetera, but it doesn't do some other thing that every other drug does, which I think is unlikely. I think the other thing just to remember about Virtus is it's a very long trial um, and was started um, in an era where um, the FDA guidance had just begun and then was changed to extend it to address, to test for efficacy, having previous, having originally just been designed to look at safety. And I think some of those operational issues can have a real impact on trial adherence, on um, you know, background therapies that might also um, interfere with the ability to show clear benefits. So I don't know the answer, but I... I suspect it was probably bad luck, but um, without another trial um, to demonstrate clear benefit, which isn't happening to my knowledge and I doubt will happen. I can't see why you would choose that drug over the others. So Flato, um, in, the population is quite similar to the Emperec population. So you would expect that if drugs are the same and the patient population is the same, the result would be approximately the same. 
But when I looked at the data, I discovered that there were many patients from the United States in Fertus, and there were many from Asia in Emperec. And where did Emperec show a large benefit in Asia? Could it be that the population is, is so different that, and the background therapies are so different that that explains the result? An interesting question, Hido, and certainly I think it could, um, the geographical distribution can contribute, um, not necessarily because the drugs have different effects in different um, ethnicities, although that's possible, but even just because of some of the cultural factors that lead to differential adherence, greater adherence in, in regions like Asia and perhaps South America, um, and perhaps less background therapies that might introduce noise um, compared to places like the US or Europe. But your data don't support that, Hido. You, you found the weakest effect, if anything, I mean, it was consistent really overall, but um, there was, certainly wasn't a greater effect in Asia than there was in North America no, or correct. Europe in your data. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. But and the, and the, other, the other one, the other thing I was thinking of, if you look, for example, at the kidney endpoints, um, what you sometimes see is a strange pattern on GFR, the acute dip, and then the, the EGFR increases again a little bit over the next few months, and then it starts to stabilize or slowly decreases in the SO2R. And that, in, that increase in EGFR directly after the initial dip is very strong with urticlifosin in all their studies. And could that be because SGLT1 is, is suddenly starting to work much more and compared to the other SGLT2 inhibitors because it's a very specific SGLT2 inhibitor, urticlifosin? And could that explain why? So so SGLT1 transport is compensating for SGLT2. Maybe, maybe the company can do some mechanistic studies to, to look at that. It's, it's speculative, I realize, but um, it could explain perhaps overcompensation of SGLT1 and why there was not such a big kidney effect as seen in Empire. Yeah. But then perhaps then we, we should pull back from the detail. Perhaps this is all noise, as, as Vlado is um, suggesting. Um, the, the trials show fantastic results. My sense is that take up in the community is, is still suboptimal. And I understand that those things are still going through their indication applications. Um, but uh, I, I, I still find even um, uh, nephrologists are hesitant about prescribing these drugs once EGFR drops below 30. Is there anything at all to support this? Or is it just we've all got to get with the program and keep patients on these drugs on them? Brendan, I'm going to target you. What's your <laughs> response to that? <laughs> so certainly um, in the Australian setting, Meg, the challenge for us is that the, the PBS indication was initially developed based on glucose lowering. So um, for us to be able to get our patients onto SGLT2 two inhibitors in Australia, they need to have an A1C of greater than seven, and they need to be on another glucose lowering agent such as metformin or glycolazide or insulin, or intolerant to um, or intolerant to one of these agents. So part, that's probably the biggest challenge in terms of translating this um, into the clinic is at the moment, we, in the patients that I see in clinic, I need to wait until the A1C gets over seven before I can put them on the agent. Um, even though we know that these drugs are clearly kidney protective in people with A1Cs less than seven, including those without diabetes. So I think that is the major challenge for us at the moment. Um, part, part, I guess another, I, um, understandable concern is um, um, familiarity with adverse effects. And I think it's important to talk to patients, so I certainly do, about, um, about recognised adverse effects. And I emphasise the importance of personal hygiene, given the small increased risk of mycotic genital infections. Um, mostly these are well tolerated and don't require permanent discontinuation of the drug, but that's important advice I give as well as sick day advice related to um, decreased oral intake or vo vomiting and, and um, diarrhea or volume depleted states and holding those drugs in those situations. But I think the major uh, challenge for us is the, is the um, diabetes indication at present. In terms of continuing the treatment below a GFR of 30, I think now we've got clear evidence both from Credence and DAPA CKD that these drugs are safe and effective and should be continued in patients if their GFR progresses down to below 30. 
and uh, my personal practice and I know many other nephrologists who I also work with now continue SGLT2 inhibition down to uh, kidney failure if they were initiated on treatment but above an EGFR of 30 and that's reflected in the prescribing labels in the United States and also now in Europe. Thank you. Kiddo, you know, any comments? Barriers to uptake? Uh, I, I agree. It's, I think we have a clear data to support the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. It's now our responsibility to implement these in practice. The uptake is still much lower than, than we had hoped for. Um, we, need to, we need to disseminate these results to all the nephrologists and, and work with patient organizations. Because maybe patient organizations can support us if they stand up just like in oncology and say, well, why, why are these drugs not being prescribed? This, this is what is happening in oncology. On, on, patient organizations in oncology are, in my view, much more focal than those in, in, in nephrology. And, and we should all stand up and, and, and work together and implement these findings in clinical practice because it saves lives. And that's a, a, a lovely note. Um, Claire, do you have any, any feedback from your colleagues or patients um, on any barriers? Are there concerns about safety or is it just inertia? Um, hoping there's no other cardiologist on the line, I'd probably say it's lack of knowledge. Um, to be honest, I think that cardiologists don't really know the drug class very well. I don't think they feel comfortable prescribing it. Um, and I don't think they, they know the indications. Um, certainly, you know, I don't know many cardiologists who would be the first person to prescribe an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, I think also from personal experience when, um, we do a lot of stopping them when they come in for angiograms and for prolonged fasting. And I think sometimes they don't get restarted. Um, and there's a lot of fears from proceduralists and, and, and anaesthetists about, you know, fasting and SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, I've also had a lot of personal experience with um, endocrinologists who are quite concerned about, um, you know, hypotension with SGLT2 inhibitors. And seem to be far more comfortable prescribing some of the other drug classes, such as the GLP-1s. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, think it's, I think it's around education, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Meg, a couple, of, a couple of comments on that. I think, um, I think all the points are really important that have been made. I think there's a couple of others that here, many people leave the diabetes management to the endocrinologist. And, you know, there's been a sense of, well, you know, the endocrinologist should manage that. And I think as nephrologists and cardiologists, we've got to change that paradigm now and say these are, we don't leave um, statin therapy to lipidologists. We all just get on and do it because we recognise how important it is. And we have a drug here that's more effective than statins at the end of the day. Um, and we should use, I think the other thing to say is that as clinicians, we're not as good as we think we are at getting the treatments to the people who need them. There's data being published in the US at the moment that some of the supposedly very high quality parts of their health system have rates of use of ACE inhibitors or ARBs, RAS inhibition, in people with proteinuric diabetic kidney disease um, of about a quarter. So three quarters of people still not even getting RAS blockade 20 years after the study has definitively showed benefit. And we see the same sort of thing you know, here in Australia with um, cardioprotective medications in people with established heart disease. We are not good at um, at getting people onto the right protective therapies and keeping them there. And I think um, the point that Hido made about patient-driven care is really important. Um, you know, how many of us, if we had diabetes or diabetic kidney disease in particular, wouldn't be demanding an SGLT2 inhibitor? And I think we should encourage our population, our patients, to do the same. That, that's, um, that's a great point um, and, and sobering that we've been slow, so slow to take up the things that, that do work. Um, we're getting close to the end of the seminar. It's, it's been fantastic and, and we're really privileged to have, have you address us, Hido. We really appreciate the time you've given. Um, any final words from you, Hido, on what you think the future looks like? We just talked about, I think, the future, about the implementation. Um, my hope for the future is that many patients will be treated with these drugs 
um, because as I said, they, they have such profound effects in a range of patient populations. They are generally safe. So I would encourage everyone to look at their patients, consider every time whether an SGLT2 inhibitor can be prescribed. And I think that can be prescribed in many patients in order to improve prognosis for every patient in your practice. Thank you. Um, final words from everyone. What, what's the next big trial that, uh, that you think should be done? The unanswered question. Vlado, you could kick off. Um, so I think two things. I think the, about combination therapy, yeah, at least in people with diabetes, you know, we have GLP-1 receptor agonists with also some evidence of benefits stronger for cardiovascular than renal outcomes at the moment, but ongoing studies. And um, we've got MRAs now with a trial um, due to report shortly. And we have the data from Sonar suggesting that endothelin antagonists might be beneficial as well. How do we use these drugs together or which drugs should we use together, I think is a really important question. The other piece is around, um, how, you know, we've done the studies showing that these drugs work. We now need to put the same effort into research, to teach us how to actually get them to the people who need them as we discussed in response to your last question. Yeah. I think that's a research question in exactly the same way um, as was addressed by DAPA, CKD and Credence and the other trials. Thanks. Uh, Brendan, final thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting. I've been thinking a lot about what Vlado has just mentioned, that um, the cardiologists talk about guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And I think moving forward, combination treatments for both diabetic and non-diabetic kidney disease are an area of, um, of um, exceptional research promise. And now we have, I think it's very clearly demonstrated that combined renin angiotensin system blockade and SGLT2 inhibition should be standard of care for people with diabetic kidney disease. And we have upcoming data for, for the third generation uh, min mineralocoid record receptor antagonist too. And it's interesting how, how, how similar guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure and, and chronic kidney disease is. And I think uh, future collaborations across the specialties are going to be really important, particularly from an implementation point of view. Yeah, good points. Claire, that leads to you. Your final thoughts? Um, so I think us cardiologists need a bit more airtime. So I'm certainly interested in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. You're all sitting a little bit smugly with all your new treatments for CKD. And we don't have anything for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I know there's a few things underway, but I'm not sure that this drug class alone is going to be the answer. Um, and I think we need to be thinking, as, as Vlado said, about combination therapy. Um, and I'm, uh, I certainly think that the combination of SGLT2 inhibition and GLP-1 receptor um, antagonist is a, is a very enticing one. You get a uh, diuresis and a naturesis and so forth, but you also get a quite impressive weight loss. Um, so I certainly think that's the next big thing that interests me. Um, and the other thing that I think is happening in the background that is very interesting is what about the newly diagnosed type 2 diabetics? What, what, what should be first line therapy in those and should it actually be SGL2 two inhibition? Mm, right. And on that, no on that note, we are testing on top of, on top of other medications at the time. So, so in Credence, DAPA, CKD, we test on top of ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers. Maybe it's time to look at, do head-to-head -head trials, comparing is our versus is still the two. Um, and, and to find out just as, as Claire said, what is the first line treatment? And um, that would, I think, be an important trial next to the combination trials that uh, all others mentioned. All right, well, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so once again, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, you, you know, we've got the world's greatest minds that have applied themselves to this question of, of generating the evidence in SGLT2's inhibitors. Um, so it's a real privilege to have you all together in one spot. Um, thank you particularly, you know, for, for making the time to join us. Um, you must be so in demand to, to spread the word about DAPA CKD and we're, we're really honoured that you could give us this time and share your insights on those trials. So thank you everybody. But next Thanks time, all. next time face to face. <laughs> Oh, that, that would be our privilege, yes. I think we're all looking to it that might day. Be a privilege. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And I hope everyone has a good evening and a good day. Um, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Have a nice evening.